The Cavalcade of America. Although it may seem late in the day to wish our listeners a Merry Christmas, all of the people associated in producing the Cavalcade of America hope that your Christmas has been full of joy for young and old. This series, presented by DuPont, brings you true stories of the traits of character that have built our nation. And nothing has been more important to the welfare and progress of America than our growing appreciation of America's children, as illustrated by this evening's dramatic episode. And when we repeat DuPont's phrase, better things for better living through chemistry, may we amplify it by saying that better living in America depends first of all on the care that all of us devote to America's children. Especially appropriate at Christmas time is Humperdinck's opera Hansel and Gretel. Its charming music accompanies the adventures of the two children in the Enchanted Forest. Our cavalcade orchestra will play some of the melodies from Hensel and Gretel. more devoted champions of humanity can be found in the world than those Americans who have loved and toiled for children. But children have had slight recognition by the state until fairly recently. A Roman father might kill his child if he pleased. An early 19th century father might let his son work 16 hours a day in a mine. But in America, this situation was to change. It is 1874 in New York City. In a small, shabby tenement room beside a woman's bed kneels Mrs. Etta Wheeler, a voluntary missionary. Isn't there something I can do? 
No messages to send to relatives? I have no relatives. Or to friends. I've been shut in so long, they've forgotten me. But this, there is one thing. If you can help that unhappy child next door. What unhappy child? Why do you think that they Now it's beginning. I think he throws her about the room first. Poor little thing. I listen to it night after night till I think I'll go mad. But are you sure a child is being hurt? Wait a bit. What that poor mite must go through before she's strong enough to escape. Oh, good heavens. And now he's picking up. Listen. Oh, I can't stand it. Where's the door to their room? Across the hall. Oh, thank God you'll go to her. Let me in. Open the door, you brute. Let me in. Uh, what do you want? I'm not going to stand what I hear going on in this room. I'm coming in. Sure, come ahead. Who cares? Look over my little palace and meet the kids. You mean that? Yeah. I'm going to the next room, stir up a little drink. Uh, bring you some, maybe? Oh, you poor little bundle of rags. Can't you get up off the floor? He didn't get it. He didn't get my dolly. You had a dolly wanted. A girl lived downstairs. Maybe out of rags. My dolly was the only one who loved me. Why did he want a dear? He said to give it to him. So I threw her out the window. Did it kill her? No, dear. It'll be lying down in the court. Come now, we'll go down and find it. I'll carry it. No, no, don't touch me. I hear it. Oh, my heavens. The welt on your shoulders and your back. Walk with me quietly. Daddy says I can't leave. I can't ever leave in my whole life because you kill me. Walk very quietly, dear. To the door. Well, what's this? Where are, you, where are you going? I'm taking your child to find the nearest policeman. Now, listen. Get out of here, you scrawly old fool. Don't touch me. Now, get out or I'll Please. throw you downstairs. No. Help. Help. Oh, somebody, help. Landa, what's the matter? Is Mrs. Wilson dying? No. I'm running for a policeman. Well, Officer McGowan is right out in front. Oh, somebody. Let me do something. Where's the fire, lady? Help. Help. Please. What's the matter? What's the matter, lady? What's happened? Listen! Listen to that poor child! Oh, that. Sure, I know, Mum. It does wring a man's heart until he's no strength left. Then why don't you do something? Why, Mum, there's nothing I can do twixt a man and his child. It is the law of the land, and we must bear it and listen to a child scream her life out. <laughs> According to law, there was nothing Mrs. Wheeler could do. But she was persistent, and a few hours later, we find her at the office of the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Mr. Gary, I haven't come about either a dog or a horse, but a child. A child? But, madam, we have nothing to do with children Doesn't here. Doesn't anyone have help for children? Mr. Gary, I have seen a thing today so tragic that I tremble thinking of it. In an east side tenement, a child is being beaten every day. I've been to the police. I've been to a magistrate. They can't save her. I know how you feel, but we can do nothing. The law in this country, and in any other country, won't interfere with families. Is there no pity in this world for a helpless child? Pity, but no law, I'm afraid. Now, in the case of Lanson versus Dennis... Mr. Gary, you're a human being first and a lawyer afterwards. I know that because of the wonderful work you've done in aiding poor helpless animals. You've got special humane officers who can make arrests, haven't you? Yes, but... Send them for this child. Why, I can't do that, Mrs. Wheeler. It's illegal. He's dying. Not quickly. No sure knife thrust and no kindly pressure on a windpipe. It's a slow death. By torture. He's being whipped so she's bleeding. Stop, Mrs. Wheeler. Fritz, Peter. What is it, Mr. Gary? An emergency case. We'll all go together. A dog or cat? I'll get the cage. Neither. A child. A child, Mr. Gary? Yes. Don't ask me any questions. You'll be less responsible in court. It's a good cause. Mrs. Wheeler, for the first time in my life, I'm leaping into a thing and trying to think of a legal excuse for it afterwards. <laughs> A few minutes.
minutes later in the tenement apartment of the father and child. Well, we got him locked in the other room all right, Mr. Gary. Pete will handle him there. He'll be ready to leave with the kid. Good. Did you get the whip and the scissors? Yeah, here they are. Well, there's some evidence anyway. Heaven knows if it'll do us any good. If he wants to have us up for abduction. Yes, sir, there'll be plenty of trouble for this day's work. What'll I ever say to a judge? That's what we've all got to decide right now. Oh, Mrs. Wheeler, how is she? She's revived wonderfully with cold water. Come, dear. Why, she's a scrap the size of me thumb. What did I tell you? Where is he? Your daddy, you mean? He's not my daddy. Daddy's dead. Oh. Then this man married your mother. Mommy's dead, too. Undoubted. Daddy thinks that's why I'm bad. Oh, darling, you're not bad. Surely that brute couldn't have adopted her. Who would let him? He came to the orphan asylum and adopted me. Can I go back to the orphan asylum? Mm, that's a plea we don't often hear. And what's your name, child? Mary Ellen. Mary Ellen. Even with those tear stains and all the dirt, you're as pretty and as dainty as a kitten. As a kitten? Why, there's our legal case. What do you mean? Mary Ellen is a small animal. Of course, she has a mind and a soul, too. But the state hasn't yet learned to concern itself about that. So the Supreme Court of the Sovereign State of New York will have to accept her as a small animal. A small animal? Yes. <laughs> Come along now and we'll see about a new doll in place of the one Mrs. Wheeler told me about. For I think you're the prettiest small animal I ever risked my legal standing for. <laughs> case of Mary Ellen, decided before the Supreme Court of New York State, sent her foster parents to prison for a year and focused national attention on the need of mercy for helpless youth. From it grew the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children, an enduring monument to the humanitarian feeling of America. Ballet in the Nutcracker Suite portrays the story of a little girl who ate too many Christmas goodies. She dreams on Christmas night as she again sees a tree lighter than all its glory, and the toys and the dolls are holding a fairy revel led by Nutcracker, Prince of Fairyland. Our DuPont Cavalcade Orchestra plays the Waltz of the Flowers from the Nutcracker Suite. Thank you. 
American cavalcade moves onward. In the present-day records of the juvenile court can be found some of the most impressive examples of America's concern for its boys and girls. In this evening's second episode, the time is the present. The first scene is a dark city street at midnight. In front of the doorway of a small grocery store, five boys, aged from 9 to 14, huddled together furtively. Jesus, cop on the other side of the street. Keep still, fellas. The chief gave us our orders. Don't make a move till a cop has passed. Gosh, he's dumb. Going right on. Yeah. Can't see a foot in front of his nose. Hold it. Come to see. What are you guys? You were waiting for me right here at the door, huh? I said for one to keep guard and the others scatter. Got a chief. Did you pull it off? Yeah, I'm right. Wait a minute. Before we go, let's leave our car. Where's the rock? Yeah. <laughs> now scram! Next day, in a poor tenement apartment, where Mr. and Mrs. Martin live with their two children, Mary and Jimmy. No, uh -huh. Where's Jimmy? Late to supper again, eh? Well, we'll sit down without him. But wait till he comes in. Oh, now, Pa, don't get in a stew. Maybe he's got a reason. Yeah, he's always got a reason. Cheeky tongue breath. He is my son. You must be feeling worse tonight, ain't you, Pa? Seems no worse than usual, Mary. Oh, there he is. So, you're back, Jimmy. Ah, keep quiet. Jimmy. Well, I know he's going to draw me for being late. But he better not try to pace me anymore, or I'll pace him. If I had my strength Listen, back, I'd... I was just coming past Ryder's Market, and the uh, front glass is all smashed out. Must have been some gangsters in there. Bandits with guns. They got almost $100 in the cash register. Oh, how awful. Where are you going, Jimmy? Into the bedroom. Ain't it all right if I comb my hair? I'll go in and talk to him. I know he's sorry already, John, for the way he talked to you. Yeah. Sure is sweet around here, Paul, since you and Jimmy got to fighting all the time. Oh, Jimmy! What's the matter? Oh, he's got it. Oh, Jimmy's got the money. It's in there. Oh, no. Now, I might have known it. A thief. Well, what's all it all about? I'll take it back to old man Ryder. Yes, you will. The police will be here any minute now. And after we got you out of the trouble you was in before with your gang, Jimmy. Buying off a fruit store, man, so he wouldn't tell the police. You'll go to jail for this, and I hope you do. I hope you do. Oh, no, John, not your own boy. Yes, I hope he does. He's been aching for it, and I hope they pick him up. Okay, well, I hope they do, too. I'll show them. <laughs> Jimmy was traced and arrested, an apparently hopeless case. A few days later, in a juvenile courtroom... The history of James Martin, age 10. Uh, is that what you want, Judge? Yes. Has he had his complete physical examination? It's here, with the laboratory test and results. Mm. And the recommendation. Here's the caseworker's report on his home. You've already seen that. Yes. How did his mental rating come out? Above normal. Hmm. You wouldn't think so from this report, Karen. Well... I may as well start the case. Show the mother in. Yes, sir. This is Martin, please. Oh, Your Honor. Your Honor, if my husband loses his temper in the courtroom and asks for the boy to be sent to reform school, don't listen to him. Oh, please, please. Mrs. Martin, don't worry. I've only called you in to ask you not to mind if Jimmy is held a few days in the detention home. That's not reform school. It's connected only with this court. We might keep him a few days while we study how to break up the gang. Oh, that's gang. Beyond that, I suppose you might check with me the accuracy of this report on Jimmy's home life. I'll read it. His father, a chronic invalid from rheumatism, teases and bullies him. He was kept out of school at one time last year until he fell behind the grade. As he is bright, school now bores him. The root of his problem is his defiance of his father. Whoever wrote that saw the truth. What do you think we should do, Mrs. Martin? I don't know. Seems like only yesterday he was the prettiest, sweetest baby he ever saw. And now, it's too late. Now, Mrs. Martin, that's something this court very rarely admits. That it's too late to help a boy. It's something I don't ever want to hear a mother admit. I'm sorry, Judge. 
That's in this case history about you. If you despair too easily. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I... that's all. I want to talk to your son alone. Yes, sir. When does court start? Why, it has started. This is court. Yes, but where's the big desk and, and the people? We don't have any big desks or any people. This is a children's court. And we don't care to frighten them. Oh. That's all, Mrs. Martin. Thank you for calling. Yes, sir. Uh, you can use this other door. Oh, thank you. Goodbye, Mrs. Martin. Goodbye, and, and God bless you. Jimmy Martin. Hello, son. You gonna send me up? Why? Am I going to the pen? Heavens, no. Sit down there. Make yourself comfortable. There's no use asking me about the stick-ups I've been in, because I won't tell. I see. Well, then, we'll just skip all that and start with the present. Jimmy, you've got quite a gang, haven't you? Yeah, they're tough guys. How many are there? Five? Seven. Three of them are older than me, too. They call me Chief. And Chief Martin? Nah, just Chief. Last year, Jimmy, when an officer of the Crime Prevention Bureau was in your neighborhood, he tried to get your gang to join the boys' club down there, and you wouldn't let them. Now, why was that? Ah, uh, we knew what that five foot was after. Trying to break us up. I hear he wanted to teach you how to play baseball. That's just a game. Now, wait a minute. Takes a lot of muscle to play baseball. Let's feel your muscle. Hold out your arm. Hmm. Soft. I ain't sure. Boys club you wouldn't join. It turned out a first-class baseball team in one year. We could beat them without looking at them. I'd like to see you try that sometime. What are you trying to get me in a judge? You said you could beat them. Suppose you try it. Yeah. We'd have to have a while of getting shaved. You can have a month. You stay at one of our boarding homes and train. And, Jimmy, if you lose the game, I become head of the gang. What do you mean, Judge? If you've been a good chief, the boys will win. If you've been a bad one, you'll lose. You can't have a gang unless you know how to run it. That's all. You may go. Yeah, but don't you want to hear about how I opened the cash register? Then I picked up a rock as big as your fist and heaved it through the window? No, I'm not interested in that. Only in how you're going to come out in this baseball game. When you've played that, son, we'll have another talk. Jimmy prepared for the great ball game that was to prove his ability as a leader. A month later, in the juvenile court, the judge talks to Mr. Martin. He's a spirited boy, Mr. Martin, with a strong love of adventure in him. And he didn't have any way to take it out. Yes, I know. I, I didn't help him any. That side of a boy has to come out in games. I have to talk to fathers about that. A mother can't help. Now, so many fathers neglect their sons because they have to work too hard. I know you've got a better excuse. Well, I guess I'll let my rheumatism give me too much of a grub. Well, the clinic will help your rheumatism. In the meantime, it's never too late for a fresh start. Why, I've got more hope than I've had in months, Judge. I was uh, so proud of the kid. Darn near died when, when I thought that he'd gone wrong on me so early. Well, he didn't go wrong. You've got a great boy. Good luck, Martin. No, thanks, Judge. Right, sir. Jimmy Martin. Well, how's the manager of the Chicago Cubs feeling today? Ah, uh, gee. I can't figure out what happened. And I hear your pitching was pretty wild. Well, sort of. But they had all a break. Jimmy Martin, that's the first thing I've heard you say that I didn't like to hear. A good ball player stands up to it, see? You were licked, weren't you? Well, admit it. All right. But gosh, Judge, when that little runt that played second base for him hit that two bag on his seventh, there was that was luck. I'm afraid you and your boys wouldn't be much help to Mickey Cochran. Out of training. I feel awful about it, Judge. I don't blame you. Well, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? You and your gang, I mean my gang now, are going to train every day at the boys' club. You'll spend a good bit of time with your probation officer. And, oh yes, you're moving home. Your father's mystery. He has? He was over here talking to me about it. He's awfully fond of you, Jimmy. He, he's a good guy. Your dad doesn't feel so well, you know. He needs all the help you can give him. 
Well, you going to try to go straight for us? See, I don't know. When I decide to do a thing, I stick to a thing. So I got to make up my mind. Well, you think it over for a minute. Well, the only thing I like to be besides a gangster is an airmail pilot. Well, Jimmy, you ought to know a lot about motors. All kinds if you're going to fly. How would you like to go to a class at a good trade school in the early evening? Why, sure. But, but if it costs anything... Oh, no, it won't cost a cent. You're going into a special class at your own grade school for a while, too. But you'll catch up with your right class. How about it, Jimmy? Sure. I'll do it. No hard feelings, I hope, about that baseball game. Oh, I do no, Judge. I can take it. So I think we're still friends. You bet we are. Take hands on it, Judge. The humanitarian urge, the desire to protect those weaker than themselves, that is a civilizing and ennobling influence in the hearts of Americans today. Nowhere has it shown itself more clearly than in the great legal and social protection given to children, those young citizens of our nation, to whom we must pass the leadership of the cavalcade of America. America has learned, is still learning, how to care for and appreciate America's children. And on Christmas Day, which belongs to children more than any other day of the year, we should devoutly hope that the grown-ups of America and of the world, will never forget their responsibility to the coming generation. If the world is to be worth living in tomorrow, today's children must be happy and healthy, must be allowed to grow mentally and spiritually. The youngster who is out playing today should in a few years be devoting that energy to engineering, medicine, architecture, chemistry, or some other useful pursuit. Naturally, we of DuPont like to think of him as a chemist, each year from leading universities, fine young fellows come into our research laboratories or join some other part of our organization. It is a great pride to us to see them develop into men whose contribution of many products useful in the daily life of everyone is summed up in DuPont's phrase, better things for better living through chemistry. At this same time, DuPont will again present the Cavalcade of America. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. WABC, New York.